The key deer. To all outward appearances, it is a common white-tailed deer, no different than the white tails found in northern states or the Everglades. Look again, this time with a human as a reference point. This fully grown key deer is only about one-third the size of its northern cousins, little more than half the size of an Everglades white tail. The adorable key deer is a remarkable example of an animal which has adapted itself to an often harsh environment. In the 1940s, the key deer was hunted to the brink of extinction. While it remains endangered today, the efforts of committed individuals and the creation of a refuge have brought the key deer back to a fairly stable population of several hundred animals. Join us now as we visit the National Key Deer Refuge to tell the story of these miniature whitetails, which are often called toy deer. Key deer's big problem is that it's unique, it's small, it's in the middle of a very fast growing area. You got a lot of contention between economic development and preservation. And uh, a lot of people feel that, well, what the heck, you know, you know, we got a lot of deer around the country and around the world. Why worry about little old key deer? Uh, they just don't see any value in uh, preserving a unique species. And some people feel it's not even unique. So, you know, it's going to be a constant struggle for people that, who have the responsibility of the maintenance of, of, and the operation of the park itself, the refuge, as well as all of the people in the chain of command all the way up to the director of the National Park Service in the budget fight. So, and uh, it's going to take all of the efforts of the Florida delegation, all of the muscle they can muster, <laughs> so to speak, um, in maintaining what we need for Florida. The Florida Keys, a chain of islands that stretches for more than 100 miles in the southwesterly arc from the mainland to Key West. Between Marathon and Key West and the Lower Keys lies the National Key Deer Refuge, whose boundaries partially overlap the larger Great White Heron National Wildlife Refuge. The refuge encompasses more than 8,000 acres and includes all or part of 18 keys, most of them uninhabited by humans. However, about two-thirds of the present key deer population may be found here on Big Pine Key and the adjoining No Name Key, both of which are partially developed. The refuge headquarters, staffed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service personnel, is located on Big Pine Key. Many people are surprised to find deer living in the Florida Keys, since the island habitat is so different from the thick, lush forests where white-tailed deer are typically found in most other states. So how did these little deer become a part of the fauna of the Lower Keys? It is believed that thousands of years ago, the Keys were a solid strip of land, which allowed for the migration of white-tailed deer from what is now the mainland. As the earth thawed after the last ice age, ocean levels rose, flooding part of the land bridge, leaving the deer stranded on the small islands. The first reported sighting of key deer was by a crewman on one of Christopher Columbus' ships. Subsequently, Spanish shipwreck survivor Hernando de Escalante Fontaneda recorded the sighting of key deer in his diary, calling the deer a great wonder Scientists don't think key deer ever existed in great numbers, but the population was surely larger than it is today. And at the beginning of the migration, they were probably larger animals, possibly the size of the white-tailed deer found throughout the South today. There is a divergence of opinion as to how the key deer evolved into a subspecies that is now the smallest native deer in North America. Some scientists explain that the deer and many other species get progressively smaller from North to South because warmer climates mean animals don't need large body mass to maintain thermal regulation, body heat. Others believe the key deer evolved into a more compact subspecies in order to economize on fresh water, which is scarce in the Keys. And since there were no large land predators in the Keys, the deer did not require long legs to outrun pursuers. Of course, that was before humans arrived in the Keys in the form of explorers and settlers. For nearly 400 years, the deer were killed for food and sport, and often just because they were considered pests. By the time hunting was banned by the state in 1939, the key deer population had seriously dwindled. A cartoon by famed biologist and artist Ding Darling depicting deer being driven into the water by dogs and hunters 
brought the plight of the tiny deer to national attention. At one point, it was estimated the key deer population had been reduced to fewer than 50 animals. Kippy Watson was growing up in the refuge about the time the deer population hit its low. At that time, Big Pine, I think, probably had about 600 people during the winter months. It probably maximum at that time. And you wouldn't see a deer. I think it was probably somewhere around between 30 to maybe 75 deer at the most on they figured about 18 different keys they were on at that time. And you'd see one once in a while. I mean, you wouldn't, you could go out and spend a week walking around and you wouldn't see a deer. And then, uh, I think mean, now you can pretty much drive around any time and see them either in somebody's yard or crossing the road somewhere. Kippy Watson, now a Monroe County fire chief, grew up in the refuge because it was his father, Jack, who brought an end to the deer poaching that continued long after the 1939 hunting ban. Watson was the U.S. game warden at the Great White Heron Refuge when, in 1954, the Boone and Crockett Club and the National Wildlife Federation paid for him to extend his patrols into the key deer habitat. The poachers were a rough bunch who resented the federal intrusion on their way of life and frequently threatened Watson. Part of the problem was they'd set the islands on fire and burn the islands off to chase the deer off, and they'd take them. They'd basically hit them in the head with a hammer or a hatchet or shoot them, run dogs on them and chase them out. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot of discontentment with the fact that they were not be able to do those things anymore. And he would shoot dogs if they were running the deer up here. Uh, he'd sent many hours out here in the woods with the mosquitoes at that time was before uh, we had any kind of mosquito control down here and you wouldn't be standing here right now. <laughs> but uh, he'd sit out here for hours on hours and wait for somebody to come along. And he'd uh, seen him take a few times and put a full, full bullet holes in carburetors on cars and uh, he'd uh, burn a couple boats when they left them on the islands when he heard their dogs running. So. It's not a means that they recommend today, but at the time it was what took, and it did the job. In the 1950s, efforts were underway to create a refuge for the key deer, but three bills were voted down in Congress because of strong opposition from developers and others in the Keys. But Representatives Charles Bennett and Dante Fassell didn't give up, and on the fourth try in 1957, the legislation was passed, creating the National Key Deer Refuge. There were a lot of people uh, and the, uh, who were opposed to the concept of a key deer refuge in the middle of Big Pine Key or any place else in the Keys. They felt too much land has already been taken by the government. Uh, that was one thing, and that would uh, slow down economic development, which meant big bucks. And the other, well, there were some people who just didn't think there was such a thing as a key deer. It, it, somebody just made it up and that they were just, uh, you know, young deer or something, and that there was no subspecies of the Virginia white-tailed deer uh, called a key deer. And, um, but uh, all of that was uh, overcome one way or another, you know, basically because of the scientific part of it, and uh, also because there was a strong support, environmental support from the people themselves who who uh, wanted to see something unique in the world preserved. Jack Watson became the first manager of the refuge, and over the next three decades would see the key deer population make a remarkable recovery. Today, the key deer are a highly visible part of the landscape on Big Pine and No Name Keys, and are often spotted on the uninhabited offshore islands. And while the key deer population is relatively stable at around 300 animals, the species still faces a variety of threats simply because of the presence of people. The refuge is unusual because a major portion is not isolated wilderness where animals only encounter people on the fringes. Roads, vehicles, homes, businesses. They were all here before the refuge was created. As the keys have grown in popularity, more people have taken up residence on Big Pine and No Name Keys. More people means less deer habitat more threats to the existence of the little deer. Since the deer are supposed to be wild animals, why would so many of them choose to live in such close proximity to humans rather than on the other keys?
One reason is water. The uh, approximate 300 animals that, that are known, uh, about two-thirds of them are found on, on Big Pine Key and No Name Key, and then the rest are spread out over a couple dozen other, other islands. Islands that have year-round fresh water resources are what's basically needed to keep the deer out there. During the rainy season, they may go to other islands uh, for months or weeks at a time, uh, but as soon as the water dries up, they have to get back to an island that has fresh water on it to survive. Big Pine and No Name Keys also have extensive pine land and hardwood habitat, which are preferred by the deer, and the most plentiful food supplies. The deer feed on more than 160 plant species, including red, black, and white mangrove, thatch palm, silver palm, and grasses. While it is true that the key deer population rebounded during a time of human growth, it is also reasonable to assume that the number of deer would be vastly greater if they were more isolated from busy highways and less habitat had been lost. More than two million tourists drive to Key West each year, and they pass right through the Key Deer Refuge on busy U.S. Highway 1. Other streets and state highways crisscross the refuge on populated Big Pine and No Name Keys. The roads have become death traps for the key deer. About 30 to 50 of the tiny deer die each year on these highways. Many more are injured. This deer was hit along US-1 a few weeks ago. Had some head injuries. And he's uh, recuperating, as you can see on, so on the side, he's got some cuts on him. But unfortunately, he's blind, and we don't know if the blindness is temporary. We've seen this on some other deer that have been injured. Uh, keep them for a few weeks, give them antibiotics, and um, just treat them for their injuries. And they sometimes just come back around and regain their sight. Although deer may collide with cars and trucks in daylight hours and at night throughout the year, there are times when they are especially vulnerable. Uh, the birth rate seems to be about two to one bucks to does. So uh, initially there was more bucks in the population. As time goes on though, uh, more bucks seem to perish than, than does. Uh, they perish primarily because uh, certain times of the year, uh, for instance in November when rut season is at its peak, uh, the younger bucks are being pushed around the keys and they're being bounced around almost like a ping pong ball. They don't know where to go because a larger buck, uh, a more dominant buck, Will, will get them out of their territory. When they're pushed to new areas, they do not know the road systems, they, they're uh, sort of stressed out, and they may not be paying attention to cars uh, like they would be at other times of the year. That's one of the reasons. Another reason, in, uh, when uh, the birth season rolls around in May and June, the uh, female deer that has a new young will uh, try to push out the yearling for, from the year before and a lot of those are, again, bucks that are being pushed out into new areas that, for the same reasons, don't know where they're at and uh, may, may have a higher stress level, and they tend to get hit more often. Bucks uh, do roam a lot more than, than does. Does tend to stay in one area for a lot longer time, whereas the bucks are, are moving out to uh, different parts of the, uh, of the lower keys. Wildlife biologists are constantly studying the deer, even in death. Necropsies are performed on most of the animals found dead in the refuge in order to add to the body of knowledge about the health of the herd and the environmental factors which affect the lives of the key deer. Having so many people in and around the refuge often helps save deer lives because collisions with vehicles are frequently witnessed or the injured animals are spotted along the highways. Cooperative efforts of the Fish and Wildlife people, Sheriff's Department and Refuge volunteers mean that injured deer receive first aid as quickly as possible. Those with minor injuries are often treated by a local veterinarian. Those requiring more critical medical care may be sent to Metro Zoo in Miami, or even to the University of Florida Veterinary School. Those that make a sufficient recovery are returned to the refuge and are released back into the wild, hopefully a little wiser for the experience. Okay. Where? Let me right in the shin. I got 
He's on his way, walking back into the wild. The wild's a big pine key. It isn't just cars that cause death and injury to the key deer. On Big Pine Key, early residents dug more than 100 miles of mosquito ditches. These were intended as places where small fish would eat the larvae produced by breeding mosquitoes. The problem is tiny fawns tumble into them and drown. And during times of high water levels, adult deer can break legs because they can't see the ditches. The Fish and Wildlife Service and Florida's Department of Environmental Protection has been gradually filling in the ditches. Humans cause problems for deer in other ways. Through the years, many deer have learned to associate food with people. It's tough for a tourist to refuse a snack to such an adorable animal. And residents have been equally guilty of feeding deer. Feeding causes some social behavioral changes with the deer. They tend to congregate in areas where they normally wouldn't congregate. Uh, there may, you, may be, you may see six or eight deer at one time uh, together. If a disease uh, outbreak were to occur, deer that are normally solitary animals, if they congregate together, they can spread disease. Also, uh, road kills can be increased by feeding. They get attracted to humans, they see a car coming, slow down, and they'll come out to the road and actually look for a handout. Uh, the individual handout might not hurt the deer, it's, it's like giving uh, candy to a kid, but if it's done over and over again, the deer can lose some of their, their, uh, their stamina and lose their, uh, uh, or become more tame as time goes on. Big Pine homeowner Jim Hicks says there are always deer around his house. He doesn't feed them, but says the deer feed on new shoots after he mows the lawn. And once, they even climb the stairs to the second floor deck to feast on tomato plants. I think it's a small herd that stays around here all the time. They, uh, after they've eaten here a while, they may go through the bush here and uh, go up the street a ways. And then maybe later on in the afternoon, the same group uh, will come back. And then sometimes they'll go out through the bush over there. And, but uh, most of the time, they hang around here. And in the afternoons, when the sun is up like it is right now, why they'll lounge around and chew their cud. Uh, this is like a cow, really. I mean, uh, they'll eat and then they bring it up and chew it some more while they're, they're relaxing under these palm trees over here. But uh, I think that we cut the grass here and, that, and the new shoots come up. That kind of entices them. A few blocks away, deer are a common sight in the Port Pine Heights development near the north end of Big Pine Key. They wander the streets, sleep in yards and carports, and sometimes get handouts. Dr. Klimstra, uh, who was considered the uh, foremost uh, key deer researcher before he passed away last year, used to call deer that lived in these subdivisions uh, key deer zombies because it's certainly not natural behavior and it's not healthy for the key deer. They, uh, it's called ganging when they congregate like that in one area looking for a handout. Uh, it tends to um, not provide them with the kind of natural diet that they require and it uh, in encourages them to uh, be around wh where people are living, which encourages things like road kills. Uh, dogs might chase them and so on. It's not a good behavior situation for the key deer. Living close to humans also means being close to their pets. In the past, several deer have been killed by roaming dogs. Obviously, managing such a refuge involves balancing acts, preservation versus development, protecting deer while not completely isolating them from the public view enforcing laws and regulations while maintaining a harmony with the human residents of the refuge. It's a big job for the Fish and Wildlife Service, which has just eight full-time employees in the refuge, and they are also involved in the management of three other refuges from Key Largo to Key West. Fortunately, there are civilian volunteers, concerned residents of the area who, after undergoing training, perform critical tasks within the Key Deer Refuge. They handle clerical and administrative jobs, help with refuge maintenance and management, undertake wildlife counts, speak at schools, and conduct tours and information sessions for visitors. That allows the fish and wildlife people to spend more time enforcing speed limits and regulations against feeding or harassing the deer, and to concentrate more effort on research, land acquisition, and preservation of existing habitat. 
The refuge also gets help from the Key Deer Protection Alliance, a community-based grassroots organization which produces information and educational material and maintains signs reminding refuge visitors of the plight of the key deer. Members of the Alliance also make their voices heard in Washington. Well, as a tax-exempt organization, of course, we're prohibited from doing too much lobbying, but we can provide information, uh, accurate, objective information, to our legislators as to uh, what our feelings are on protection of key deer. Uh, particularly as members, as individual members, we can let them know that we as constituents feel that the key deer and its habitat need better protection efforts from Washington. Of the 6,500 acres of land on Big Pine Key, the government owns some 3,000 undeveloped acres. That includes a large tract of prime deer habitat near the north end of the island. Visitors have access to some of the habitat at the Nature Trail off Key Deer Boulevard and the nearby Blue Hole. This is an old rock quarry, which is the largest source of fresh water on the key. Several alligators live in Blue Hole, and one recently was removed to a new home because he had become a hazard to visitors. The remaining undeveloped acreage on Big Pine is privately owned, meaning it could be developed, resulting in a further loss of key deer habitat. One house and one subdivision, difficult to say that's really going to impact the key deer, but if you add up the numbers over a long period of time, and you see population growth like we've had in the last 20 years, that does not bode well for the key deer. 20 years from now, if we had the same level of development we had in the previous 20, uh, we'd see some very serious major impacts on key deer and a real fundamental change in their habitat here, the nature of it. For several years, the Fish and Wildlife Service had been spending up to $2 million a year buying parcels of land, some of them as small as single lots located between existing homes. The idea is to maintain natural corridors connecting the patchwork of public lands to allow the deer to migrate throughout the island and minimize contact with people. But in 1993, federal land acquisition funds dried up with the retirement of Congressman Fassell, who had always managed to get money for the refuge. We, we just can't ever get enough money in the system to do it all and stay ahead of what it is that we think is essential um, for the country. And the key deer is caught up in that. So that means you have to establish priorities. And uh, priorities, uh, you know, you got a scientific dispute about what's going on. And as long as, and so it was a constant struggle to maintain a place for the key deer refuge to acquire the land. Far better uh, to have acquired all of that land immediately and solve that problem. Uh, with respect to land acquisition, when you get uh, a, really any endangered species, but particularly the key deer, uh, preservation of habitat is critical to their survival. Uh, an animal like the key deer requires certainly, you know, X number of acres, I don't know how many exactly, uh, per animal, and uh, they need certain things in their habitat, such as uh, food supply, fresh water supply, um, areas to breed, and um, by the very nature of this small area of the island community, uh, preservation of habitat is a ver very much of a priority. Having greater access to the public lands is an important factor in the life cycle of the key deer. A typical adult buck might range over 400 acres in a year, about half that for an adult doe. Since fully developed bucks mate with more than one doe, in rutting season they cover a lot of territory seeking out mates. Further loss of habitat would force more onto the highways. Rutting season is a time of additional peril for adult bucks. Retaining or establishing dominance over a group of does, or just gaining the privilege of mating with a single doe often means a fight. The losers, even the winners, frequently wind up in the hands of wildlife officers for treatment of their wounds. Small though they may be, a buck with a full antler rack can inflict considerable damage on an opponent, especially around the head and neck. Most of the time, the deer require little more than first aid possibly a visit to the local vet, and some rest in a pen. Occasionally, though, a buck will die from wounds received in a fight. This buck spent a few days under treatment for antler-inflicted wounds, then was released in the same area where he was found. He wasted little time in returning to rutting behavior. Hardly a minute had passed before he was aggressively rubbing his antlers on trees and bushes, serving notice on other bucks that he considers this his territory, and he's back in the hunt.
In the late spring fawning season, does move deeper into the woods to give birth. Even those that hang out around homes will find secret places in which to bear their young. Fawns, incidentally, remain entirely hidden during the first two or three weeks of life. After that, they start following the mother, but often are too shy or nervous to come out into the open. Tiny fawns are occasionally spotted along highways, but many will remain out of sight of humans until they have lost their spots. We should also point out that bucks are, for the most part, solitary animals. Two or three may temporarily gather to feed, but they don't travel in packs. Does, on the other hand, form small herds, usually made up of an older lead doe, some of her female offspring from previous years, and all their new fawns. The does will often care for one another's fawns to allow mothers to seek some solitude. In addition to acquiring lands, the Fish and Wildlife Service has to maintain existing habitat to make sure food sources remain accessible. That means prescribed burning of some areas. We have a prescribed burning program here basically for two reasons. One is, is to minimize the amount of uh, fuel that builds up on the, on the forest floor so that when a lightning strike occurs, there won't be a catastrophic fire. The second reason is we burn uh, to assist with the deer and the animals that need fire to survive. These pine trees basically would not grow unless uh, the forest floors opened up through fire and the seeds could regenerate. Also, after a fire, a lot of new growth comes up and a lot of plants that the deer like to eat uh, sprout up in a matter of, uh, of days or weeks. Grasses and, and little herba herbaceous type plants will be, will be growing and the deer uh, are in here in a matter of, of hours. We've, we've actually even seen deer come in as the fire is going on. They will come in and check out the area. I guess through their evolution, they know that once there's a fire, there's going to be some uh, nice new uh, grasses coming up and uh, things that they're going to want to eat. The Fish and Wildlife Service also devotes a great deal of time and effort to educating the public about key deer. Those efforts can be seen in the hundreds of signs in and around the refuge. They've been especially effective in building awareness among the local residents. Tourists, however, don't always slow down on US-1. Visits with homeowners have been generally successful in stopping the illegal feeding of key deer. The fact that deer continue living around homes had prompted some suggestions that such deer be removed to other islands. Some of the suggestions have come from developers who would like to see the deer out of the way. These deer swim probably better than any other white-tailed deer, I mean certainly better than any other white-tailed deer in the country. Uh, they're on Big Pine because they want to be on Big Pine. There's certain requirements in their habitat that exist on Big Pine that aren't on these out islands, or they would swim to the out islands and go there. Uh, if they were uh, captured and moved to some of these out islands, chances are they either die down to a small dwindling, dwindling population or more likely swim right back to Big Pine. With so many remote islands in the refuge, the deer do take swims in search of food, isolation, or just a change of scenery. Often the water is shallow enough for them to walk, although at their size they appear to be swimming. One case uh, a few years back, we had a deer that had a radio collar on it, uh, a doe. She went out to a relatively small island, had no uh, fresh water on it. She had a baby on the island. She. Uh, almost daily or every other day would have to come back to the mainland uh, or, a, or a key that had water on it and then go back and nurse her deer, nurse her young. Uh, so that, that one was relatively interesting that she would do uh, swim and walk uh, almost uh, a mile just to get uh, back and forth uh, to that island to nurse her young. Although the population of key deer now seems fairly stable, their future remains threatened by human activity especially continued development of privately owned critical habitat. There are fears that increases in competition for land use could drastically reduce the number of key deer. That makes it doubly important to continue the acquisition of private lands within the refuge. Uh, we're in a race, really, with uh, the acquisition program and development. Uh, can we buy it before it's all developed, the vacant land, the, the private land that's, that's on the island now? Can we buy enough of that in the next decade or so to protect the, the habitat sufficiently so the key deer can survive on into the future. That's an open question. Uh, it's very expensive land. Uh, there's not a lot in terms of acreage. We're dealing in thousands of acres, not tens of thousands as on some refuges, but 
the land is subdivided largely and uh, the, the lots are small and expensive, so it's a very uh, labor and cost intensive kind of a uh, land acquisition program. Of course, everybody can help ensure the survival of these wonderful animals. Residents and visitors alike can observe the speed limits, drive extra carefully in and around the refuge, and refrain from feeding or harassing the tiny deer. It's okay to photograph the deer. Just don't chase them into traffic while trying for a close-up. The best advice is look, but don't touch. You could contact your U.S. Senator or a representative for continued funding for land acquisition you could become a refuge volunteer, they're always needed. Or you could join an organization such as the Key Deer Protection Alliance. Well, as a nonprofit, all volunteer organization, the more help we get, the more successful we are. Um, anybody can contact us either with uh, donations or in uh, volunteering their services. Uh, we can be reached at Post Office Box 224, Big Pine Key, Florida, zip code 33043. Remember, these toy deer are the only ones of their kind. They deserve better than to become another entry in the Journal of Extinct Species. They deserve to survive right here in their traditional home, the Florida Keys. This program was produced and licensed by International Video Projects Incorporated of Lakeland, Florida. For additional information about this program and other programs we offer, please write International Video Projects, 6700 South Florida Avenue, Suite 28, Lakeland, Florida, 33813-3312, or call toll-free 800-852-0662. Our collection of programs may also be reviewed on our website www.videoprojects.tv Thanks for watching.